Okay, welcome back to the Bishy PE podcast. We're absolutely delighted to be joined by ex-professional footballer, current VT sports pundit and Northern Irish legend, Stephen Kagan. <laughs> welcome, Stephen. <laughs> That's, that's very kind, I've got to say that. I thought you were going to introduce someone else there, but then it was me, so that's fine. I agree with that. We're also joined by our usual, by Mr. McHugh. <laughs> and we're also joined by senior pupil, Uthman Mehmood. How are we, Uthman? Yeah, all right, how are you? Perfect, good. Okay, Quite any questions? I'll kick us off then, Stephen. So, first question is about your school career. So, how did you sure. find your school career and did you stay on at school or did you leave early? Well, being from Northern Ireland, the, the schooling system is slightly different than what it is here in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, when you get to, to high school, we have to do five years and then we can stay on and do six and seven. So, it's GCSEs, uh, fourth and fifth year, and then sixth and seventh would be A-levels. Whereas over here it's standard grades and hires, isn't it? So you only do four years. Yeah. So uh, I just done the bog standard five years. And then uh, because my school only done the five, you have to go to a different school to do your higher, or do your A level. So I just went to college. Um, I went to college to do uh, a sport and tourism course or leisure and tourism course from the ages of 16 to 18. But as it transpired, uh, my football career took over. And at the age of 17, I had to leave halfway through that course, and that's when I eventually joined Motherwell at the age of 17. So, um, what, five years at school, and then in one year at college, and then into professional football for me. Right, okay. So, was, was college over here then, in Scotland, or was it? No, no. College was back in Northern Ireland. Right, college okay. Was back in Northern Ireland. I was supposed to, I'd done a, a, probably six months at Motherwell College when I first arrived. As mm -hmm. part of my parents wanted me to do that, but it, it kind of drifted off. Football took over. It took up most of my day, so I didn't get the opportunity to go and finish anything, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the subjects, what was your favourite subjects at school? Uh, I've got to be honest, I wasn't, I wasn't a, a top A-level student. Uh, I, I certainly wasn't the bottom of the class. It was probably more down to do with me and my application, if I'm being brutally honest. You know, you try and give a message to young, I've got a 10-year-old daughter, and you're giving the message, you've got to go and stick in at school, and you do, absolutely. Uh, I enjoyed geography because I just enjoyed looking around the world and see not where I would like to go one day, but I was intrigued by by football. So to see teams from different countries and capitals yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, history at school was was some local history, so it was quite good to know a little bit about your own country. So they were probably the two for me that stood out, along with PE, of course. Stephen, what what would your teacher's perception of yourself be? Would they think you're a bit of a tour rag? Or would they think, ah, he's all right? No, I would like to think that they thought I was all right. You know, the majority of my reports would have been, could do a little bit better. <laughs> could, you know, could test himself a little bit more. And that was probably right. You know, 14, 15, 16, you've got other things in your mind. I had dreams of what I wanted to be. And it was a case of trying to finish school as quick as you can to see where it takes you. Looking back now, of course, you always have the reverse of that and think school was the most important thing. You know, you try and emphasize that onto your children and your nieces and your nephews, that it is the important time. You're not always going to get the dream that you hope one day you will get. So um, I have met, I mean, I haven't saw some of my teacher for years. I've been back a couple of times in the early days to go and do different talks and things. And it was very well received. And, and, and you know, when you come out of school, you probably look at them a little bit different. And they probably look at you a little bit differently. But I certainly wasn't a tour, I guess, for sure. <laughs> Uh, over to me, is it, Mr. Johnson? Yes, that's yeah, question. Um, Stephen, I mean, obviously when you were younger, you mentioned there you left when you were 17. But did you have any jobs in between there that maybe helped shape you for the future, give you some kind of skills and whatnot for well, later life? During the summer holidays, the school summer holidays, I was always keen. I always liked a few pounds in my pocket or try and get a few pounds in my pocket. And where I'm from in Northern Ireland is a little place called Cumber, uh, C-O-M-B-E-R. It's just in the outskirts of Belfast, probably 10 or 12 miles. The little town I lived in was surrounded by fields and we were, God, that town's well known for potatoes, cumber spuds as they're called back home. So we had lots of potato fields. So during the summer I used to go and work in the farm. Not not yeah. my farm, just a farm locally to pick potatoes. Yeah. Um, I just thought, first of all, I'll give you a few quid in your pocket. My mum and dad quite liked it because it gave you a little bit of discipline. 
you know, it meant you had to get into your routine. You weren't just sitting about being lazy and not doing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I also worked in a building site at the age of 15. My, my dad's pal owned a building company and was looking for someone to help out. So I think all those things kind of shape you because it, it, it gives you that opportunity of, you know, working within a, uh, an adult industry to see how hard people have to work, how dedicated they are to their profession, whether it's, you know, potatoes or building or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, listen, I enjoyed it because I had a few quid in my pocket. You know, you get out to see a little bit of the wide world. Uh, and it, it's not something I wanted to do in long term, yeah. but it certainly lays the foundations of hard work, that's for sure. Were you, were you paid by Spud? Or were you, how much were you paid? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got paid in, in some potatoes, but uh, hard earned cash. It didn't go through the books, but I was only 14, so I didn't have to pay tax when I was 14 and 15. <laughs> We'll, we'll no tell, we'll no tell. Um, I think Usman's got the next question when you go, Usman. Uh, uh, could you tell us a wee bit about your journey uh, and like, your route into professional football? Like, how that came about? Yeah. yeah, well, probably like a lot of young boys and girls nowadays, you know, you grew up playing football. I played in the back garden. I played with my brothers. I played for local teams. I went to the boys' brigade. Uh, I played for a local boys' club. I uh, played for the high school. But whenever I went to college, we had a college side and... We actually came to Air in Scotland mm-hmm. in nine, Easter of 1994. It would have been, I would have been probably 17. I was 17. And we just came to play in a tournament. Uh, we got to the semi-finals of the final. We didn't win it. But there was lots of scouts down from Scottish clubs. And Motherwell actually took nine of our players over in trial. But whenever they went in trial, I was on holiday with my parents. So I wasn't able to go that week. I had to go a following week on my own. And out of the nine of us who went over, uh, they offered contracts to three of us. Uh, and the three of us joined up in September 1994. Uh, as I said, I was 17, leaving home. So the majority of the time, you know, certainly young football apprenticeships started at the age of 16. So a lot of guys that I'd played with through international level at under 14, 15, 16, they had all gone at 16, where I, I was almost two, well, I was probably 18 months behind them leaving. So as I was going over, a lot of them were getting ready to come home. So whether that extra year or so at home in Northern Ireland helped me, um, made me a little bit more mature, got me playing, you know, some more football locally back home before I made that step across. So that's how my journey came from going from Northern Ireland over to over to Scotland. Had you played the international football like, at younger ages, at under sixteen level and stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah. I actually didn't. I didn't make the under fifteen squad, which was the, which was the Victory Shield squad as it was known as then. It was the the kind of schoolboy squad. I didn't make that squad, and of course, then the world ended. I was devastated. You don't get into that. But a year later, I'd made the under-16 squad. So I had I'd played in Turkey. We'd played in Austria. Uh, we'd played in Switzerland. It's uh, at under-16. So the, the majority of the guys in that squad had gone across at 16 to join. Some joined Rangers. Some joined Leeds. One joined Liverpool. Some joined Southampton, Chelsea, Crew. That's the kind of clubs they went to, where I I was just playing part time football back home. Was this from your Was this from your boys' club side, or were you playing for like you know, an equivalent to well, pro youth side? Yeah, I was. Well, you see, we didn't have pro youth back then in Northern Ireland. I was playing for just a, an Irish league club, which would have been Bangor. They were no, They have now dropped down the league since then. But you know, the prominent teams in Northern Ireland would be Linfield, Glentoran, Coleraine, Cliftonville, Palomina, Larne. That kind of standard. So semi professional then. It was two or three nights a week. They've kind of aged now towards being more full time, and they have academies underneath. But when I was growing up and back in the day, shall we say, we didn't have youth academies. Oh, really? One of our one of our deputies, Mr. Johnson, is at Institute. Is that the right? Is that the right? Yeah, team? yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Institute. But Absolutely. every time, every time you look at the league tables, you seem to be lingering down the bottom end. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot about him. <laughs> I think they got relegated last last year. To be fair, they're one of the smaller clubs. They wouldn't have a huge investment. They're a big fan base. So for them to be in the top flight, it's probably achievement on its own. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, Stephen, just moving into your your professional career. Um, obviously, you spent some time uh, with Motherwell and a couple other clubs. Could you tell us about that journey and, and really sum it up in terms of that experience as a whole? Yeah, it's funny when you you know I left home at seventeen. Uh, came, you know, joined a Motherwell. You thought that's it. That's me. I'm a professional footballer. I, this is me for the next twenty years. Um, it wasn't as straightforward as that. I, I spent six years in the first spell at Motherwell. I made my debut in 1997, about three, just about three years after I joined. Uh, in those first six years, I played a total of 32 games, whether that was either starting or coming off the bench. Mm-hmm. So it, 
at the age of 23, I got the news that uh, my contract wasn't being renewed. I was being released. I could go on somewhere else. And naturally, it comes as a bit of a hammer blow to you. Although kind of in the back of my mind, I probably sensed it was coming because I wasn't playing very often. Mm -hmm. um, during the summer of 2000, I actually went to, this may be getting into one of the other questions, but I'll, I'll go with it anyway. I went to, I got released and I didn't have a club for, for a spell over the summer because clubs weren't recruiting. There was lots of players out of contract. I was just another one of those players who had trained four or five times a week, played the odd game, uh, didn't really have a profile. And I ended up having to go and sign in the dole at 23 because, I mean, I wasn't on the bread line, but I needed some sort of, or sorry, the job sent to my wife's shouting. Um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't have a lot of money behind me. I wasn't a high profile player. So I needed some sort of income just to supplement bills and and and, uh, and food and things like that. So that was almost a rude awakening for me, mm -hmm. coming out of there thinking something's got to change. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do the same as everyone else, I'm just going to be the same as everyone else. So I, I, I made a couple of tough decisions or had a bit of self-analysis um, and decided I had to change moving forward. Thankfully, I got a club. I got Percy Thistle in that summer. I left the top flight in Scottish football to go to the third tier. But if I'm honest, it didn't really bother me because it was it was a second chance for me. And you look around, probably in life and a lot of aspects, whether it's business or sport, not many people get a third chance. So my second chance was effectively my last one. And I had to make sure I made best use of it. So I just looked at things. Um, I looked at my diet. I looked at my training schedule. Um, I looked at my body weight, my body fat, how I could be different than everyone else because if I just trained another three or four days and done the same as everyone else the previous or my first six years as a professional that taught me I wasn't going to be good enough to get where I wanted to get to. So uh, I implemented all that. I spoke to a sports psychologist. I spoke to a dietitian. I spoke to a strength and conditioning coach, which back then, you know, you speak about youth academies nowadays, that's all on a plate for them. They go in and they get that all handed to them. I had to go and search for that. So uh, I had to, do, you know, and invest a little bit of money in myself as well, kind of to do all that. So uh, my first season at Partick Thistle, uh, I played 43 games out of 44. So suddenly going from 32 games in six years, you play 43 in one year. Uh, I stayed another two years there and total of Thistle played 125 games. So suddenly I learned what it was like to be a professional footballer. I had had the high of signing for Motherwell, the low of getting released and having to go to the job centre and the high of starting to build back up. Um, I ended up back in the in the top flight with Partick Thistle. And after the three years, after getting released at Motherwell, they came in back and offered me a contract to bring me back to the football club. So it's amazing how things go in a full cycle. I was a more rounded player, more mature, understood what I needed to be to be a professional footballer. I then spent a further nine years at Motherwell, retired in 2012, having played a total of 548 games. And during my first spell, or sorry, during my spell at Partick Thistle 2002, I made my international debut for Northern Ireland. Uh, and fortunately, managed to go on and play 54 times for them as well. So it just shows you from the age of 23 to 35, it was a remarkable turnaround. Yeah. And I think that was me accepting responsibility for my actions, taking account, accountability for what I was going to do and how I was going to get there was, was big for me. And that's the one bit of advice I give to anyone, any young person trying to make their way in business or sport or TV or whatever it may be. Be accountable for your own actions. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be prepared. Because if you do, it's amazing how far it'll take you. Yep. Just on that accountability, Mr. Johnson actually left their store cupboard open this afternoon uh, <laughs> caused a bit, of a, a, bit of a, a bit of a damage in the department. So I think it's about time he takes a bit of accountability. <laughs> He's trying to paint himself as some kind of angel here. He, Mr. McHugh's yeah. not done his register for about three months. Let's see. So he can't say all the home truths are coming out. It's all about accountability, guys. <laughs> uh, Steve, obviously, you, you spent the majority of your career in Scotland and, and represented your country 54 times, as you said there. You played with and against some excellent players. Is there any that stand out for you, Zach? Well, what a player. Yeah, international football was a big thing for me. You know, jumping from, from club football in Scotland. At the level I was playing at with Motherwell at Partick Fist, there was a huge jump to international football. Suddenly you're playing against some of the world's best. Um, I hate kind of talking about it because it, I don't want it to be egotistical, but some of the ones I've played against, uh, we beat England in 2005 at Windsor Park. Mm -hmm. uh, the team was what Rio Ferdinand and Ashley Cole, David Beckham, Wayne Rooney, Michael Owen, Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard. Um, David Healy scored the goal, David is now managed 
uh, back manager Linfield. The following year, one year, one day later, we beat Spain at Windsor Park, who had Raul and, and, and uh, Sergio Ramos, uh, David Villa. Uh, my wife's giving me all the names here. Raul said him, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, I, I know. so, you know, that was a huge step up for me. And all that kind of preparation and stuff I spoke about, the sports psychologist doing things different than everyone else, making sure you're, you were lean, you were robust, that your body fat was right, your weight, doing preparation before the game, studying the opponents. That all gave me that opportunity for closing that gap. Uh, I played against Portugal, Sweden. I played against Zlatan Ibrahimovic, uh, Andrea Pirlo, Cristiano Ronaldo was only young at the time. I think he was 19-20. We drew 1-1 in Belfast with them. So for me to get to that level, I mean, I didn't play against them every week. But still, it's on my CV that I've played against them at some stage. So guys like that were just, you know, just in awe for me to watch them. I used to watch them on TV like everyone else, and suddenly you're lining up in the tunnel beside these kind of guys, and you think to yourself, "How they got there?" And some people would say, "You know, you were lucky, or you, you know, you got by chance." But I know deep down what I put into my career and what I dedicated myself to to get that opportunity. So that was guys I played against. You know, guys like Aaron Hughes, who I played with in Northern Ireland. Johnny Evans is still playing at Leicester City. Uh, two phenomenal players, Steve Davis, who is, who is playing for Rangers and, and, and getting younger, it looks like, game by game. So they were probably three of the top players that I played with at international level. Stephen, you'd mentioned there a couple of times about sports psychologist and working with a sports psychologist. What, what yeah. did that involve? What kind of things were you, were you doing? The, the two main things for me were uh, setting goals. The first one, when I spoke to him, when I joined Partick Thistle, he said to me, what's your plan? What do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't really know. I don't have a plan. I just know I want to play football somewhere. I know there's a, a place for me somewhere. I would love to find it, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. He said, have you ever thought of goal setting? Have you ever thought of writing things down and, and, and setting goals? And I said, well, no, I haven't. And he said, well, if you write them down, it's almost like committing to them. He said, mm -hmm. there's, a more, there's more of a chance of you getting those goals or achieving those goals if you write them down because it's, re it's, it's more realistic. You're almost making a promise to yourself. You're putting them down put them up somewhere so if you go off track and things don't work, you have disappointing days, you have a poor game, you get injured, there's something to go back to to say, listen, this is a bump in the road, but these are my targets. The three goals I set when I joined Thistle in two, uh, the year 2000, because we're in the third tier, I wanted to be back playing top flight football as soon as possible. That took two years. Uh, I wanted to play for Northern Ireland. I didn't know how many times. That was achieved in two years. And... Uh, when I got back to the top flight of Scottish football, I wanted to make sure I didn't leave it again. I didn't want to come back down the leagues. I wanted to make sure that I had some longevity and I wanted to retire as a top flight football player. So those three things were achieved for me. It took a number of years to get the third one, obviously, but it, it just gave me a little bit of direction. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading recently about, without boring everybody, I was reading something recently about, uh, there was a, a test case carried at, at, at Harvard University in 2005 it was the graduates leaving the university and they asked the, all the graduates if they had set goals or if they'd written goals down. 84% uh, said they hadn't thought about it. I think 13% said they had thought about it in their mind, so it's something in their mind. And 3% had actually written it down on paper. They revisited it 10 years later and they based it on earnings in those 10 years. The... 13% had earned twice as much as the 87%. So the 87% who hadn't thought of anything, the 13% who had thought about it in their mind but hadn't put it on paper, they earned twice as much as the, as the 87%. Mm. The 3% who had written it down and put it somewhere to focus on had earned 10 times as much as the rest put together. So whether that's applicable in every business, I don't know. But certainly, you know, the whole aim is, is that by putting it down, you're making a commitment and a promise to yourself and it continually gives you something to aim for. So that was number one for me. The second one that, that I'd kind of came across myself because we'd, we'd, we'd pieced about it, I kept a logbook of players and teams that I'd played against. When I played against them, I made a logbook. So when I came to play against them five or six or seven weeks later, I was able to flick them a logbook and think, right, what posed me problems during that game? What was difficult for me? What was the style of play like? Did they, you know, did they play long balls? Did they play in defeat? Did they play in behind? So it meant then when I was going on to the game on a Saturday, I was trying to give myself an edge. I was trying to cut down the margin for error, whereas I had studied the player and the team. Yeah. Sometimes you come up against a player or a team who's done something different and there's nothing you can do about it or you have to adapt in game. But trying to close that gap, there was players who were bigger than me, quicker than me, stronger than me, 
uh, technically better than me, had much more attributes or many more attributes, sorry. So I had to try and be different and close my gap on those kind of attributes they had. And by goal setting, um, by looking after myself physically, by having the logbook allow me to do that. And that's something I took into games against England and Sweden and Spain and whoever else, because I then had to go and do that. I wouldn't say I was ever the best player on the pitch, but I, I certainly looked at myself as being the best prepared player on the pitch. And that's what gave me the edge and, and gave me the belief that I could go and compete. Brilliant. Because that's, that's probably two really big topics in the higher PE course that we speak about, goal setting and then kind of monitoring performance and through, yeah. through maybe a training diary. So I think we'll just cut that video of you speaking there for the last minute or so and just show yeah, it to the, the kids. Yeah, yeah. Listen, if, you know, I understand in these tough times it's difficult, it's difficult to get into a school or I don't know where that's popped, but I would certainly be quite happy to come in and talk about it. It wouldn't bother me at some stage if that's what you felt oh, was you know, good for the kids moving forward, you know? You'd love that. Brilliant. See, um, see these okay, you bud, sorry, see these goals you set? Like uh, how realistic did you think they were at the time? So like did you set like the goals that you thought were like a million miles away or like you could like reach out and touch them, basically? Well those three that I set uh in in June or July two thousand seemed miles away for me. Because I had been to the job centre, I had the disappointment. I was almost starting from scratch again. I was 23 years of age, where a lot of people might, maybe might have had that reality check at 18, 19. So I had, I had limited time to try and achieve what I wanted to achieve. So, you know, playing for Northern Ireland, uh, returning to the top flight and retiring as a top flight player seemed miles away because I was playing in the third tier. I was at League One now of Scottish football. So I thought, I'll have a go at that. I'll be honest, I did look at things on a daily basis or a weekly basis. You know, I wanted to make sure I trained every day. I wanted to make sure I was available for selection, which meant I had to be leaner, fitter, stronger, so I could train every day. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was in the team or available for selection on a Friday. And when I played on a Saturday, I wanted to try and make sure I was the best player. So all these small goals, those big ones were kind of, I wouldn't say put to the back burner, they were on my wall so I could see them. Yeah. But, you know, doing these smaller ones daily and weekly and monthly and yearly allowed me to get closer to those ones. Um, you know, I spoke about being different because being different for me was doing recovery sessions, uh, having a healthy diet, um, having ice baths, sleeping patterns, training patterns, training longer. When people went home in the afternoon, I went to the gym. When people took a Sunday off, Sunday off I went training. So I was putting all these little things together so that, that would make me or, or make my goals more achievable. A lot of stuff was done in the background and people didn't know which didn't really bother me because I was seeing progress on the pitch. So yes, you have the long-term goals, but certainly for me, it worked to have ones daily, weekly and monthly and yearly. So it felt as if you were achieving something and you felt as if you were getting somewhere as opposed to thinking yeah. that's still miles away. It still seems a distance away. Excellent. Yeah, I get it. Um, Stephen, what, what about in terms of managers? We, we spoke about players there, but is there any managers that really stood out for you and perhaps any memorable knowledge and advice that you gave you in your career? Um... I don't really have anything that stands out with regards, you know, one piece of advice that any single manager gave. In fact, I suppose you do. The only one would be, or the main one would be Craig Brown. Of course, Craig managed Scotland. Uh, the younger generation uh, won't remember Scotland being in a major tournament, actually, 1998. But Craig was a manager in 1998 when Scotland went to the World Cup. Uh, Craig was mother of manager for about 18 months. And he said to me at the time, just because he saw how hard I worked and what I do, or what I was doing, what I was dedicating, and he said, with your, with your mindset and, and your single-mindedness and how you approach your job in football, he says, you will have longevity beyond playing because the habits you have now and the way you conduct yourself is how you will conduct yourself as you progress out of football. Mm -hmm. He said, people who are in football and have short-term success and get money and, uh, you know, if they don't apply themselves the way they should, when they finish their, you know, their career will effectively fall off a cliff. So that was one bit of advice he gave to me was continue that and maintain it. Craig was very good because he was a very good man manager. You know, he never got flustered. He looked after his players. They came first. So just looking at the human side of 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 a football manager, how they, you know, dealt with players was was encouraging for me and actually opened my eyes a little bit. So listen, I worked with some good managers like Terry Butcher and Mark McGee. Um, Morris Malpass, 
guys who, uh, Stuart McCall, guys who were successful as players and have been successful as managers. I got on great with them all. I didn't really have any enemies. But uh, I had my own job. I had my own plan to do. So whether they were there or not, it was about me being single-minded in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I think you've touched on it, Stephen, but if you were to pick maybe one, what would be the highlight of your professional footballing career? Well, uh, it's... A couple of things, probably, you know, getting the chance to play international football, but getting to compete and obviously beat England at Windsor Park. That was a one-off occasion that I think Northern Ireland beat England once in 75 years. So yeah. it's once in a lifetime opportunity. And, and people still talk about it, even though our country has been to the Euros in 2016. They've done well over the last seven, eight years. People who were at that game, it was one of those JFK moments when people say, where were you that night? And I have the, the good fortune to say, well, I was standing in the middle of the pitch, you know, so I lived a lot of people's dreams that night. And when you represent your country, you're not just carrying it for your teammates and your family. It's a nation. And it's getting that, you know, you're one of those 11 players who's getting that good fortune and that chance to go and do what many of them would love to have done. So those games naturally were big. I think getting the 50 caps, because I learned when I'd said I wanted to play for Northern Ireland and I thought about goal setting. Once I got one, I then set for five. And when I got the five, I thought, there's no point in setting targets anymore. My aim from five onwards was get the next one and get the next one, you know, rather than looking at 30, 40, because if you didn't reach it, then there's a sense of disappointment. Mm. And I've listened to a lot of podcasts recently and, and, and someone has said, don't set limits. Don't set too many limits because you then sometimes stop achieving because you reach that limit and you stop. So international caps for me was an open book. Just see where it'll take me. Just keep getting the next one, the next one, the next one. And my focus solely every time I played was to get six, was to get seven, was to eight, was to get nine. So when I got to 50 and I got the chance to captain my country uh, in Slovenia and we, we won by single goal to nil. How we won by a single goal to nil, I have no, I have no idea. We got absolutely battered from start to finish. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was a night, proud night for me, proud night for the family. Uh, so international football was huge because it meant so much to everybody in the family and everybody in Northern Ireland. But I think... You know, the standout moment or moments was getting the chance just to be a professional footballer, but also having that realisation at 23 that if you're not careful and you don't treat it right yeah. and you don't look at it from a different angle, you won't be able to maintain it or you won't have any longevity. It's actually so refreshing to speak to somebody that's so passionate that you can even talk like listening to you just now and so passionate about what you've achieved and, and what you've done so far. So you see, sorry, I just had to put that in there. That, that's very kind. It's funny because I never actually really enjoyed a lot of it at the time I mean I speak about the England game quite a lot when I, I do different talks but uh, Terry Butcher who was the manager of Motherwell at the time was working for the radio station BBC Radio 5, uh, BBC radio 5 Live and after the game when we beat them uh, he texted me after and said I'll, I'll see you in the morning and I said no I'm on the afternoon flight he said you're not I'll see you in the morning <laughs> and I said right okay so I had to change my flight that night to get a about a half seven or eight o'clock flight in the morning to get back into the club. On the Saturday, we were away to Inverness. So I came back on the Thursday morning. He didn't speak to me on the Thursday and he didn't speak to me on the Friday. And I thought this, I thought he'd be patting me in the back and say, well done. But I, I thought this is kind of weird. So I then started to doubt, was I going to be playing the team against Inverness on the Saturday away from home? So we took a long bus journey up to Inverness and he named the team on the Saturday and I was in it. But he still hadn't said a word to me. So I got out with the game. We're coming at half time. We're losing by a single goal to nil. Uh, and of course, it was my man that scored. And that was the floodgates for Terry to come and absolutely lambast me in front of my teammates, tell me it was a disgrace that I could do it on a Wednesday night against Mike Alone and David Beckham and Wayne Rooney, but I couldn't do it at Inverness in front of 2,000 people on a Saturday afternoon. And I thought, oh. So I had to bite my tongue. I was wanting to knock his head off his shoulders, but I couldn't. I had to keep myself to myself. So we ended up winning the game 2 1. And he came in after the game. He says, Oh, Craigs, that was my nickname. He says, Give us a hug. I said, I don't want to speak to you. I, I couldn't speak to him. It wasn't until the Monday or the Tuesday that I, I got around. But that was his way of just refocusing me yeah. and, and, and just letting me know that it wasn't all about me. It wasn't all. So it brought me back down to earth. But that taught me a lesson of any time I played in a big game and we were successful, the minute I walked out of the changing room, I went to the bin. Mm-hmm. And my next focus was on the next game and the next game. So when you're talking about passionately and looking back, I've got the chance over the past few years to enjoy it and to speak about it because I didn't enjoy it at the time. Yeah, Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, can you can you recall a setback um, in your career and how it helped you grow uh, as a player and just as a person? Yeah, it, it, it probably takes you back to the 
to go into the job centre, 23. Now, I touched on it briefly, but yeah. walking in that day, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for me, having that dream as a young boy, uh, and people have it now, young boys and young girls, if you have a dream, you should do everything in your power to fulfil that dream. And I'd felt in those first six years, as a professional footballer, I hadn't done that. I wasn't committed to what I was trying to do. Uh, I was let, taking my eye off the ball. So that was a reality check for me to say, you've got one more chance. You've got another chance if you want. You can walk out of this place today and you can change your mindset. Uh, you can be accountable for your own actions. You can be responsible for who you're going to be and where you're going to get to. You can't do it yourself. You're going to need some help. I kind of realized that what I knew wasn't enough. So that was the reality check for me. I, I, I had two choices then. I had a choice of pack up and go home mm -hmm. or fight against it, get everything that I've got, commit myself and see where it takes me. And that was the, the, the turning point for me because if Mother would have offered me another contract, I'd probably have taken it. And it would have been the following year to have been released. If not, then it would have been the following year because I wasn't on the right path. I didn't have the right mindset and I didn't have a plan in place. So that kind of woke me up to thinking, whoa, you know, I've, I've got another opportunity. I have to make this work. And I get to work on and off the pitch to make it happen. So it made me grow as a person because it made me mature. Uh, it made me a little bit different. And, and suddenly when you change and you're different within your own group, I would say, don't be frightened to be different. If you have a dream or an aim or an ambition, don't just stick to what you're doing because everyone else is, because you'll just be the same as them. It's your career, it's your life, it's your future and your dream. So not just yourself, but anyone else listening, you have to go for it. And people will, will look at you, they'll maybe challenge you why you're different, why you're doing things or different, you're not doing the same as everyone else. But you know deep down single-mindedly what you want and what you're going to achieve. Enjoy yourself absolutely and, and, and have plenty of friends, but you know, you will decide what your future is. And I found out, it was 23 by the time I found it out. And once I got it, I thought, this is me, this is what I want to do. So that setback probably set me up for moving forward. And even listen, I spoke with the games I played and teams I played against. It wasn't all straightforward. There was setbacks, there was injuries, there was loss of form. Uh, I had a dreadful habit of scoring own goals. I, uh, I scored 23 own goals in my career. So there was many, there was many a Saturday night I sat in the house and thought, I've scored a winner for the opposition. How am I going to get back on the horse? But again, I, you know, I flick back to my goals, I flick back to my my dreams and my targets, and it, it just refocuses you and puts all the neg uh, all the negativity behind and allows you to allows you to go forward again. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like a lot of footballers who then go on to make it or play Premiership football, Scottish Premiership, English Premiership, whatever. Um, they go through a time where they they like they have to give football everything like that's all they've got. They put themselves in a position where like this is it. It's football or I go and do I don't know, like work in a call centre or something yeah. or yeah. Necessarily. Well that that's why when you go right back to the very start when we speak about school, about how important it is to get qualifications, your standard grades, uh, your your hires, university. I didn't have that option. I left home at 17. So when I was here, I thought the only option I have is football. Mm -hmm. Looking back now, I would have ch changed things dramatically. You know, I would have stuck in at school a little bit more. I would have given myself an opportunity that if football didn't work, I would have had an education to fall back on. Probably in the early days of football, I would have done something running along beside it. I would have done a, a course in the evening. I would have done something that meant all my eggs weren't in the one basket. But once they were in the one basket, I then I made it. stick with it. Do you think you would have made it if you had given yourself two options? Like maybe if you got released at, by Motherwell at, what was it, 20 you got released? 23? Uh, uh, 23, yeah. 23, do you think maybe if you had something to fall back on, you would have just been like, okay, football, that's that's done for me. I'm going to go and do my, whatever I've done at uni or something then? Possibly, yeah. That would have been the crossroads I was at. I would have had to make a decision of, is it worthwhile pursuing what I think you know could be a dead end? Or do I think, do you know what, I've had six years and it hasn't worked, I'm going to take a different direction. Probably, I would say I'm stubborn. I would have probably pushed another year. And if it hadn't have worked, then I would have definitely um, went another route, would have taken another another path in life, which would have been outside football. Um, but when I was making that choice, I don't, listen, I only had a one-year contract at Party Kissel. Uh, and when I looked, actually, I said one year, it was 10 months and there was 44 games scheduled for that season, which actually was 3,960 minutes. That's what my career boiled down to, 3,960 minutes. 
And I took ill in the, in the build-up to my first game, which is why when I said earlier, I played 43 or 44 games because I took ill. So I actually ended up with 3,870 minutes. And that's what it boiled down to. So of those 3,870 minutes had to work, I would have definitely taken a different career path. Marcel Johnson. Um, so my next question, Stephen, is about your television career. So how did that come about? Yeah. How did you enter television? Yeah, I'll probably not be as in-depth with this, guys. So apologies for the, for the long-winded answers. Um, just towards the end of my career, the last four or five years, I got asked to do some radio with BBC Scotland. Uh, that kind of progressed into doing some TV with BBC Radio Scot uh, with BBC Scotland, doing some games, uh, some Sunday games, some highlights programs. Uh, ESPN then asked me to do some stuff. Who were covering Scottish football along with Sky at the time? They had a dual partnership, so it kind of just snowballed from there. And 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 the older I got, I thought I'm actually quite enjoying this. I always thought as a player, I'll be a coach, I'll be a coach, I'll be a coach, and then this kind of opened my eyes to something different, which was just looking at the game from a different angle, still involved in the game. Um, you know, probably more relaxed than coaching or playing was ever going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that kind of intrigued me a little bit and actually I retired in 2012 Motherwell had offered me a one year deal I was 35 and ESPN had offered me a one year deal and the guy who offered me it at ESPN and the TV said this may not be here in a year's time mm -hmm. so I'm just giving you that option so I thought I'm 35 I'll probably play for one maybe two years more this could be an avenue down a different pathway for me to you know start a media career so I decided to retire and take the one year contract with ESPN Lo and behold, a year later, they decided to pack up and go to America, I'd go back to America and leave me kind of high and dry. But BT Sport took over and, and fortunately, the, the contacts I'd made in that first year allowed me to get into BT Sport and take it from there. So um, media-wise was, was through BBC Scotland, was through ESPN, doing some radio and TV when I was still playing. Sorry. Yeah, like something like that. Is it all just about who you know eh, to get into that well, kind of industry? Well, it... Initially, it probably helped me because I had a profile, mm -hmm. because I was a, a current player at that time. If I was someone just walking in off the street and said, oh, you know, I've, I've played a couple of games here and there, can I get a job? Probably not. It's probably more difficult. Uh, there were people naturally coming through university who would have been presenters or working behind the scenes in TV and radio. But because I had the profile of being a current player at that time, it allows you to get in front of the cameras. And it allows you to get in front of bosses. It's then up to you then to to show you know what you're talking about. And, you know, I speak about the in-depth of being a player. I was the exact same as a pundit. I still am. I, you know, I, I do my research. I, I'd sit for hours on end trying to cover useless information. But I always like the case of, I always say to the presenter, you can ask me anything and I'll be able to answer it. Because I feel as if if you can wait, uh, broaden your horizons and, you know, extend your knowledge and everything you talk about, then you've got a chance of having some longevity. So, um yeah, you probably have to have a profile to become a pundit. You have to play at some sort of level. But once you're in, then again, to have longevity, you've got to do your work. Absolutely. What would you say is the best part about being a, a BT Sports pundit? Yeah. This year, actually, I, I've went a bit more freelance. I've, I've done some international games for Sky, right. Northern Ireland games, and some BBC, and doing some BT, which is good. So, first of all, the variety of mm -hmm. working for different companies and, and, and meeting different connections. But I think still being involved in the game, you know, when you're passionate about your sport and passionate about what you do, to still be involved in football from a different angle, you know, to see games every weekend, not as much so now. I, I, I go to the odd game, I'm working at the studios more, not, more often than not. But, you know, I, I worked at some big games. I worked at Northern Ireland against Germany. I've been in Germany, Northern Ireland. I've been in Rotterdam for Holland, Northern Ireland. I've covered an Old Firm Cup final. I've uh, done the Scottish Cup final. I've done big games in Scotland so just to be involved at the high end of our game here in Scotland you know coaching playing was great but I think still to be involved in the media side of it and getting to see what goes on getting to see the big games the big occasions and comment on them and see the big moments is, uh, is, is very rewarding Yeah Moving over to you uh, uh, Who's your favourite pundit? Who's your favourite pundit to work with even? Yeah um to be fair, the majority of the ones I work with are absolutely fine. You know, there's no, I wouldn't say I have a favourite one. I would say I enjoy working with, uh, because it's a different way. Ali McCoy treats it a different way. He's quite humorous. He's always up for a laugh. He's always trying to take away the serious side of it. I, I, I would be very serious in what I do and very, you know, focused on what I'm doing, where sometimes he just opens your eyes. He broadens your horizons a little bit where it, he has a joke and a laugh and it kind of lightens the mood. So, um, you know, you have to be careful what you say because in, <laughs> 
you can offend people very very easily. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I've had phone calls from managers and players and texts from managers and players saying they didn't agree with what I said or didn't agree with my point. Yeah. So, uh, so it is very serious. So it is nice when you have Ali on board where things can be a little more relaxed, a bit more humorous. And, uh, and if you do say something wrong, he's first to jump on it and tell you you've said something wrong or it hasn't been right. So I would say Ali's certainly up there. Yeah, I must ask, what, you and, and Mr Sutton, is it a love-hate relationship or is it just can he stand him? Yeah, I think he loves me and I hate him. <laughs> it's not. It's not. We, uh, listen, we, we were given carte blanche by, by BT Sport, by our, our boss up here effectively, to go and cr- try and create TV programmes that would intrigue people, that people would want to watch, uh, be opinionated, don't be frightened to say what you think. If you think someone's wrong, dig them up. Yeah. Uh, if you want to have an argument, fire away with it. So, you know, we weren't told what to say, but he was trying to give us, or trying to relax things a little bit more rather than just to stand up. Hi, good afternoon, welcome. We're at Fir Park, yeah. we're at Celtic Park. This is, you know, to try and make it a bit more relaxed where people actually want to tune in to think what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, how's the programme going to kick off tonight? Who's going to fall out with who? Mm-hmm. So it, it got people tuning in half an hour before the game yeah. as opposed to just flicking on it two minutes before it. And that was the whole aim of it. So, yes, and we got on okay. We're not best mates. We don't speak all the time. But I think we respect each other and, and our jobs. Is he, is he still on your Christmas card list? Uh, I don't send Christmas cards. <laughs> <laughs> I would send them to him. <laughs> oh, right. Well, that was your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Live television can be very unpredictable. Can you tell us about any memorable interviews slash moments you've had? Yeah, when I I probably came to prominence, I, I had a slide tackle against Chris Sutton at, at, at Fir Park. And after that tackle, some people have actually forgot that I used to play football, that people know me and remember me more for that tackle. A tackle I made with my clothes on uh, live on the TV, people seem to remember me more for that than actually playing. So uh, <laughs> just moments like that stick out. You know, we had a, a, a kind of an ongoing battle. He's through a uh, custard pie on my face I've kicked him into the North Sea so just moments like that where you know just shows that football isn't all serious you're allowed to go and have a laugh and enjoy yourself and sometimes laughing at yourself is the best you know because everybody joins in sees you don't take yourself seriously so it's uh, moments like that always kind of stand out always enjoyable things to do I must be honest Stephen I, uh, I was a big fan of the BT Sports so fingers crossed that we managed to get it back on our television uh, but that's just my personal thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> believe me, mine's the exact same. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, but, uh, just to kind of last question before we go into your finish up, you, you, I'm curious advice uh, throughout the, the interview today. Is there any more advice that you would give for any young athletes, football, broadcasting, just anything for the youth to uh, round us off with? Yeah. I think the most important thing is, is, is to love what you do. Mm-hmm. If you're not loving what you're doing, you won't be fully committed to it it will almost feel at times like a chore or it's a hindrance to you. So if you're doing something that you're not enjoying, I've spoken about, don't be frightened to change and go somewhere else. Find your passion because once you find your passion, it's amazing how the dedication will change, your mindset will change, your focus on what you're doing will change. And by committing everything to it, you'll be amazed at how far you can go. You have to enjoy yourself, no doubt about it. Um, Don't be frightened to be different. If you have something in your mind you want to achieve, don't be frightened to go off path and go your own direction because you know where you want to get to. It is hard to be different from a crowd. and absolutely is. I get that because your peers sometimes can, can try and push you down a path you do want to go. But it's all about single-mindedness. And once you start to sense a little bit of success or you feel as if you're making inroads uh, with the passion, with the love of what you do and your single-mindedness, it's amazing how far it'll take you. I'm living proof of someone who was average at what they've done, how they overachieved. People say overachieved. I say I probably fulfilled potential because I pushed my boundaries and I've done things a little bit different than everyone else. I took myself out of my comfort zone. So don't ever think you can't achieve things. Set your goals as high as you want. Reach for them. Reach for the stars is what they say because if you don't get the stars, you might touch the clouds. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, your finisher, Stephen, um, just a wee fun finisher if you can create. The perfect funder panel. Three people. Who would they be and why? Yeah. Because I, I've spoke a lot about enjoying yourself and having a bit of a laugh, I, I would probably pick Chris Kamara, first of all. 
All right, okay. Yeah. Same on Soccer Saturday. He works on the uh, what's his what's the TV program he works on? Ninja Warriors. Yeah. Just for anybody who doesn't know, that he just seems a right good laugh. Everything's up for fun and joy. So I think yeah. if you go to your work and you can smile and enjoy yourself, I think that certainly is a big plus. Absolutely. Uh, probably to, to combat that, I'd probably go Ali. Because, yeah. you know, even if I didn't get a word in, I could listen to those two laughing at each other and, and, and taking the mic and with a good sign. Yeah. And I'd probably, go, I'd probably go Chris because it meant, Chris Sutton, because it meant if we get the opportunity to ever have a, another slide tackle or kick him into the North Sea or, or damage him in any way, then I'd be absolutely up for it. <laughs> plus, we'd have a record argument. There were plenty of record arguments. So, I think that would be a good panel of me plus those three guys. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I'm all questioned out, Matthew Johnson. Just, uh, just one last question just before we go, Stephen. We've got a, a member of staff here at Bishop Briggs who <laughs> follows Northern Ireland basically whenever he can, <laughs> goes and watches all the games, and he, he's got a Scooby Doo outfit that he wears sometimes. So, I was just curious to know if the players actually ever noticed this up in the stands or if it was. Something you guys were aware of? Um, I don't remember it. However, if, if it was pointed out to me now, it's, it's funny because there's so many things, a lot of times even playing games, you didn't even look to the crowd. You know, yeah. you're so focused on eye level all the time. Yeah. Um, Scooby, because I've been to more games as a supporter, home and away, I would generally think that I may have came across it at some stage, but, that it's come into my, my mind at some stage, absolutely. Um, I suppose there you go that's somebody being different that's somebody trying to stand out <laughs> <laughs> somebody will notice yeah, somebody that. It stands out. it shows you <laughs> Good. brilliant thank you very much gents thank you very much Stephen um, it's been brilliant no problem um, Mr McHugh Uthman um, I think Mr Oven is getting the axe now isn't he yeah. but, uh, Uthman definitely steals his place <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us guys um, and take care pleasure thank you thank you very much Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.